Hello guys, welcome to From the North. Uh, it's been a week since our last episode, though we're we're on track of going back to our weekly schedule. So yeah, welcome everyone. Uh, as always, I'm streaming all the way from London, Ontario, and we have our friendly host Hermania, who's currently in Montreal, um, and she has some thoughts about the weather there. <laughs> I'm still in Montreal. Um, yeah, I'm not going outside for the foreseeable future. I like the cold, but when I say I like the cold, I'm talking about 35 degree Fahrenheit. But like, it's currently under 10 here. So yeah, I, I'm not doing that. Yeah, who would have thought Canada is cold, right? I know, right? Um, but uh, very appropriately and finally we're going to be talking about canada today so what better time than when we're both me and the east coast wait are you in the west coast of the country i don't even know no you're uh, not you're no, I'm, I'm kind of midwest east coast ish i'm close to detroit that's that's, uh, that's, yeah. that's geography is not my forte but finally canada's in the news on this show <laughs> um poor edu never gets to share his knowledge on canada because it's usually pretty boring politics um nothing too exciting uh happens or at least in the perception of the rest of the world, let's say. Oh, um, yeah. But now the world is paying attention to Canada and specifically uh, relating to a topic that we talk about on the show, is it, which is authoritarianism versus uh, liberal democracy. So as our watchers certainly know by now, there has been uh, a protest led by truckers in Canada. And well, Edu, you're the one with the knowledge. Tell us what's going on. So... Okay, so let's uh, let's get started from the very beginning. So um, about a month ago, there was a protest that started uh, called the Freedom Convoy. And the idea was to have a convoy of truckers going all across Canada. The convoy actually started in the Pacific Coast in British Columbia. And they made it all the way to Ottawa. That's like, there like, you go, like right. three, four days trip. Um, and they have been stationed in Ottawa in front of Parliament Hill, uh, which is where the, the house of the government here in Canada, uh, protesting against vaccination mandates. In particular, the vaccination mandate, uh, mandate uh, they're, they're more concerned about, most concerned about. Um, it's the border crossing vaccination mandate uh, for, for truckers. Uh, essentially, uh, this is a bilateral agreement between the United States and Canada that uh, if truckers cross the border, they have to show vaccination proof. Otherwise, they have to be quarantined for a few days before keep on going uh, with their trucks. Uh, most truckers, since it has been noted uh, since the beginning of the protest, are vaccinated. Some, something over like 90% of the truckers are vaccinated. Uh, but there is a small percentage of truckers that were directly affected by this because they are not vaccinated. And allegedly, a lot of them lost their jobs and are facing financial distress. And that... That's heard here too, Edwin. I want to make a point of, like uh, we always do on this show, to not lump everyone in one group and say they're the same. Because I've heard the protests are actually, the people that are going, it's a very diverse group of people and why they're showing up. Like, like you said, um, it's it, the protest itself is against the mandate, not the vaccine. Not the vaccine. That, that oh. should be very clear. It's, it's not an anti-vax right. protest. Like, a lot of people have made it seem it's a, an anti-mandate protest. Even fact, though it has attracted some anti-vax people. What I understand, um, Edu, is that apparently the leaders of the protests are very problematic people or something like this. But some people have joined who are just regular people tired of, of the COVID situation, correct? Exactly. The protest started by the truckers uh, because of the mandates, but it gained a lot of support from people all across the country that have been affected directly by this mandate. It's people that are vaccinated and people that are unvaccinated. Uh, some of the unvaccinated people have lost their jobs, uh, you know, their livelihood because... Not well, just that, but to give people perspective, uh, because in the States, it's not really like this. Uh, I don't know how it is where you are, Edu, but here in Montreal, like, bars are still closed. Life is not back to normal. Yeah, yeah, no, restrictions are pretty tough in Canada now. Uh, but again, to put everything in context, uh, we are coming back from 
the toughest wave of COVID that we've had since the pandemic began, both in terms of cases and in numbers of dead people. That's the approach that the both the provincial and federal governments decided to take. That's an important point in this conversation. Canada, it's very federal, um, like the United States. You know, provinces have a lot of autonomy in the decisions that they, they take, uh, including restrictions, vaccination passports, et cetera, et cetera. That's a provincial, uh, ma all the mandates that Canadians, day-to-day -day Canadians are living, it's it's by their provinces, okay? So like, for example, I live in Ontario, the restrictions that I'm facing here were put in place by the premier right. of Ontario. <laughs> how it is in the states and it's why i've heard some people say why are they like focusing their anger at trudeau if it's like by province so explain that because it goes back to the original uh purpose of the protest which was truckers going against particularly the mandate of border crossing vaccination um the, which was a federal thing which is a federal thing because it's canada's border the thing uh, is, the thing that a lot of people kind of don't take into consideration, uh, and that's the reason what I've been saying from the very beginning of the protest, that even though I understand people protesting because they're sick and tired of the mandates, which is fair, I don't agree with it, but I think it's completely fair and it's their right to protest. Uh, the thing about the border crossing situation is that it was not put in place by Canada to begin with. The, the one who actually started that mandate as Joe Biden and Canada thus comply to have it the same way back and forth. If you come into Canada, same situation. If you go to the United States, it's the same situation. So this is not something that the Canadian government e even has a say in. Even if Trudeau woke up tomorrow and decided to say, oh, you know what? We're going to remove the mandate for border crossings. That is only affecting half of the border. When you cross into the United States, you're still going to be asked to show vaccination passport. You're still going to have to do quarantine. Uh, so it's, it's really, and, and that's kind of the point that a lot of people are making of this, is that it's really a protest that doesn't have a, 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 an ending point because it's unattainable. Um, so it just g gives reason to the protesters to just keep going and going and going and going because the demands that they're making are are, are impossible right. for the government to meet. And while I, like the protests, I think for the big part have been peaceful, but there have been like huge messes made by some protesters, like fires. I mean, yes. loitering, like destroying, and a lot of Canadians are like really pissed about it and started counter protesting. Yes, and like particularly in Ottawa, the situation is pretty tense uh, because Ottawa has been downtown Ottawa in particular has been pretty much seized by the protesters for almost a month now okay. it's going to be a month uh, a month this this weekend um and they the situation in downtown is like imagine having 2000 trucks in the downtown of your city whatever city you're living on so it's the honking the noise the the protest centers are obviously a very few minute a minority group of the people in the protest have also incurred in some criminal activity uh one that actually was kind of scary for me was uh, one of the buildings that's right there in downtown. Some of their uh, residents just went down and, you know, talked to the guys and say, guys, like, you're making too much noise. We don't even agree with your protest. This doesn't make sense. Like, like, I'm living here. Why are you trying to fuck with me when your protest is against the government? Right. Um, and the result was is that some of the protesters actually went into the building later that day and started a fire in the lobby and then walked out and shut the doors closed with like wires and everything so people couldn't escape. Uh, fortunately, nothing happened out of that, but that's just one case of the many cases of like arson and like actual criminal activity that's had happened. But the biggest thing um, I would say uh, is what happened this past week. Uh, which is that the protesters, because this protest is concentrated in Ottawa, but it's going on all across the country. And some of the protesters very close to where I live, actually, shut down the Canadian-US border. 
uh, at the Ambassador Bridge in Detroit that connects, uh, connects the city of Detroit in the United States to the city of Windsor here in Ontario. And the problem with that is that 60% of the commerce that comes into Canada comes through that bridge. Um, so that was kind of like the tipping point in this protest. That's kind of... Because I, I do want us to focus on this most recent... Yes. Uh, because it's it sounds pretty crazy to me, and again, thank God we have Elu. Because I think most of us know nothing about how Canada works. Um, but people today are calling Trudeau a dictator and a fascist. So I go and I ask Elu, "What is happening? Is this really true?" Because the headline that I saw said Trudeau freezes the bank accounts of the protesters. So, so yes, what the break it down. <laughs> so. Uh... Kind of to end the protest, like we got to the point where all of all of Canada, pretty much, even the Liberal Party, the Conservative Party, the NDP, every major political party in Canada just was telling the government, like, you have let this be for too long and it's out of control now. And to be fair, it's completely out of control now. Uh, what are you going to do now? So the response of the of the Trudeau government was to uh, get emergency powers. And this is the first time in the history of Canada, ever since that law was put into place in the 80s, that a prime minister has actually used it. It is still not clear what the extent of the emergency powers are going to be. That's something that actually has to be discussed in Parliament. I think they're discussing that this week. Uh, but one of the things that the uh, Trudeau administration announced is that as part of the measurements that they were going to take against the protesters who are now being considered criminals, um, is that they were going to freeze temporarily their bank accounts. And that has turned on a lot of red lights and red flags because that's not something that you usually hear a government do. Usually a government ends a protest through what? police you, intervention. You hear, you hear our type of governments do, but not Western democratic nations. Yes. Uh, but again, it's complicated. My personal opinion is that that's not necessarily too horrible because I, it's it's Canada. It's not the government of Venezuela. It's not that they're just going to seize the assets and never give them back. Uh, I believe that it's a passive way to counter the protests instead of just sending the police. I believe that the police should have been called two or three weeks ago and just have it end uh, like it happened in France with their convoy just a couple days ago. Uh, but in, in the well, we know how the world treats the French government every time they, they do that. So I think this is a huge issue over this. And it's really what I focus on, like being here in Canada, it seems to me that these protests are sort of like a cultural thing, almost like the Black Lives Matter protests in the state. So yeah. it's kind of like liberal versus conservative in a new it's, like, it, it's the libertarian Canadians against like the government and putting a lot of restrictions. And so not even libertarian Canadians, it's just Canadians that are sick and tired of the restrictions, which again, I don't agree with, but I completely understand, I completely empathize, and I, and I respect their right to protest. But they have taken it too far. Um, it's been going on for too long, and this is just another example of the problem with Justin Trudeau and his liberal government that they have had since 2015, is that liberals are afraid of doing anything they are so committed to be in the center of the political spectrum here in canada that they are too afraid of doing and trudeau loves being seen as the liberal hero of the world that's why i'm i'm saying i'm mentioning like france because i don't think trudeau would like to have federal police like you know clearing out protesters for his image macron doesn't care he already the world already hates him for it and but except trudeau to be a progressive hero trudeau cares too much about his image so he would never do something that's too controversial or like directly controversial that it's going to turn canadians to the left or to the right yeah, of I the liberal party more controversial freezing people's bank accounts exactly like exactly yeah. and that's precisely it like instead of saying taking you know the controversial decision of just sending the police and ending the protest which is something that every major country would have done by this moment right um he chose instead to take like a passive approach and let it go and try to negotiate with no, them no, there are no there are no videos of this there are no there are no videos um, of this and like it, it, this is just a very 
silly way of pushing forward another passive way of ending the protest now getting into the people's financial accounts uh a lot of arguments have been put forward um the canadian government from from the very get-go has said that they're investigating where the funds are coming from for this convoy and it's no surprise they're actually coming mostly for the united states actually uh and that's the way that they're trying to justify this but it is a big red flag when you know the the way that you're trying to stop a protest is to freeze people's bank accounts Having yeah. that said, having that said, I want to make something very clear. Out of these measures and some other measures that have been taken, a lot of people are making the Canadian government look as, as it is an authoritarian government. And Trudeau has, I've seen him being called a communist and a socialist in the internet and also on the streets here in Canada. And uh, I think that's a big disservice to actual democracy uh because what's happening in canada is not we're near close to authoritarianism it's just a government that doesn't really have the balls to do what they need to do in order to quell this protest and it's just being silly and throwing around measures that are kind of torpe i don't know how to say that in english uh but they're just really getting in the way of their own government <laughs> them a huge benefit of the doubt that i feel you wouldn't give the trump administration for example uh here's the thing though uh, doing that like i'm not seeing any of my progressive friends freaking out about this possible civil rights violation of the trudeau government yes uh but then again like when you look at the scope of what he's trying to do it is something that you can consider to be like really authoritarian getting into someone's bank account but more authoritarian is what the people at the protest that are still in the protest to well, this day always a dilemma here. are trying like, to achieve, right. right? Like they have the capital of the country shut down almost for a month now. They had our borders closed for almost two weeks. Uh, so and the, and here's the other thing that not a lot of people talk about is the demands of the protesters are insane. I already talked about the border uh, mandate being lifted, which, again, is not something that the Canadian government can do. But they've gone so far as to saying, you know, and we need the mandates to be lifted federally right now. I, I know what you're saying. And this is the topic of the show, like how, you know, how far can you take the government's power versus individual liberty? And then here we talk about, well, if you're affecting the rest of us, like this protest is doing, it's affecting all of Canada, then the collective has the right, you know, to push against your civil rights. But how much is always the question. And this really just doesn't sound right to me. And it's always about the same thing when it comes to these measures and it's precedent. You know, once a government does this, then it's easier for them to pull a little farther. So that's that's what concerns me. Certainly, I don't think Trudeau is a wannabe dictator. That's not the sense I get. However, I, I do think this gives a lot of people argument to call him authoritarian. It, it does seem, I think we can call this measure authoritarian and according to political science uh, we've talked about how simple um covid measures have taken uh democracy points away from free countries just because as we have mentioned you gotta you kind of have to do it in order to control the situation but it does take away from the democracy index it does it does but it's i think it's i think it's unavoidable it, like the the way to combat the COVID pandemic, it's through vaccination and restrictions. And unfortunately, that's going to be an infringement on civil liberties, but it's for a matter of public health. And right. it's as easy as that. Like, uh, every country in the world is going through this, but now I'm going to put it on the context of Canada because it, this is a real personal thing for me. Uh, because I live here. Uh, <laughs> but, but, and you're here now. Welcome. Welcome to the actual North. So we're definitely going to keep an eye on these protests in Canada. But now is, let's just talk about the news. Of course, um, we've been following the situation in Ukraine. Um, I think we have better news today than we have had in a while. It seems the situation um, has receded a bit after days of real tension where the U.S. was like, it's going to happen anytime now. Uh, apparently, Putin has accepted to retreat some 
troops. But let's focus on what we focus on here, which is the tankies of always continuing to lick Putin's boots. And I just have such a good time with this. And I'd like to talk to you guys about it because we have to keep calling out these hypocrites. I mean, they've been carrying water for Putin like never before since the situation with Ukraine started. And, you know, uh, the tanky, I think this is one of the king of the tankies that people did not always see it, but now they're seeing it. Edward Snowden, you know, the progressive hero. He's been pissed off because according to Snowden, the media is stoking war by reporting that Putin has troops on the border with Ukraine. Like, this is the thing that's concerning to me. And like, we we talked about this a lot when we're having like our pre-production meetings and our post-production meetings, really. Uh, but we, we the, the position that the media has taken recently uh, i don't want to say that it's always been like that but at least in the time that i've been aware of what the media has to say uh they are pushing for a double truth narrative by always putting one side and the other on a balance when sometimes they shouldn't be uh the situation in ukraine is a prime example of that because really like what happened was that russia moved almost two hundred thousand troops to the border of ukraine um and then started demanding ukraine to just forget about nato which is it's illegal it's an invasion of ukraine's sovereignty at the very least if not an actual military invasion um it's something that's completely undefendable and obviously so that started yeah that is, that, that's how the situation started and but people now people like this want to frame it as the US or the West started it. And let's be clear about what happened. What does the West do first in these situations as they should is try to use diplomacy first, which is what they have done. You know, the Western democracies got together to tell Putin, you do something and we're gonna step in besides Germany, but that's another complex issue. Um, But so someone like Edward Snowden, that is the anti-war and and if Putin does indeed, take away some troops, which we have not seen that he has done it yet. We have no proof that he has done it yet, but he said he would. Then the West, through diplomacy, averted a crisis. But Snowden from Moscow says that the West was built, oh, because this is their new, this is the phrase that they use, uh, building a consensus to, to make a war. So in their mind, you know, the media lies to you about what Putin is doing, so you'll support a war. It's just like uh, the appeasement mindset, it just doesn't make sense to me whatsoever, especially in a country like the United States that has suffered so much because of appeasement movements in the past. And again, we discussed this in a previous episode, but appeasement was what they tried to do with Hitler before, you know, the US actually joined the war. Um, And that's what allowed Hitler to get away with so many things. And you cannot allow Putin, you cannot allow Russia to just get away with any political decision that he makes, especially when it directly concerns the sovereignty of an allied nation. Um, It it just baffles me. It just baffles me that this has been put on a balance. It's like, it seems that it's 50-50 now, people that are normal and would say yeah like ukraine has to be supported like this cannot be allowed to happen coordinated campaign we know it as venezuelans they always do this to us whenever something happens in venezuela there is a coordinated campaign to say that it's all a cia plot to uh, make consensus for war but let's look at the characters that are the ones pushing this narrative that the u.s is at fault in the situation with ukraine snowden literally protected by the Moscow government. That's why a lot of people, and I want to tell this to our followers because I've received some comments from people because I love trolling Snowden on Twitter because to me, he is the perfect example of a tanky. He cried begging Obama to let him come back after being a spy, begging Trump to let him come back. Yet he hates the US so much, but he cries all the time because he doesn't Moscow, but then he's always carrying Putin's water. So it's a typical Starbucks tanky that just wants to be typing that they hate the US, but they want to do it for New York City. 
They don't want to be in Moscow. They, they so, don't. They don't want to be, but they have to play the part. They have to be the well, the tanky. They have to be the pro Russian. Why? A lot of people have said oh, to me that why do I mess with Snowden if Snowden is represents what you and I stand for in this show? No, 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 honey. Edward Snowden is no freedom fighter. Neither is uh, Glenn Greenwald, who helped him with that whole campaign. And I'll tell you the difference. And, you, and just, Julian Assange, for that matter, I just want to throw that Julian out there. Julian Assange, who's also oh, the, 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 the uh, okay, yes, Julian Assange is one of these. But déjame ir por punto because okay. I don't know what to say. Okay. Um, ya ahora me perdí. Snowden, aha, okay, Snowden is just like Julian Assange and Glenn Greenwald. They're not journalists. And here's the difference: a journalist doesn't have a mission that's political. The journalist's mission is to inform, and to do that, they have to investigate and work. Characters like Julian Assange and Glenn Greenwald get things in their inbox from who knows who that always happen to make the U.S. look bad and Russia and China look good. This is not journalism. You're being an agent if you just receive something on your email and then you publish it and all your work has the mission of bringing down U.S. credibility. Uh, and that, my friend, is why Edward Snowden is no hero to me. And that's, that's super important that you mention it because these are the people that are carrying out the flag of anti-imperialism um, because th these are the same people that want to, you know, push the narrative that imperialism, it's only when the United States does it. Which, to be fair, yes, they do. And yes, they shouldn't be doing it. And yes, we should call them out every time that they do it. But the ones that are actually being more actively imperialist, like in threatening to invade another country to f prevent them from joining NATO, for example, or setting a debt trap in Africa, for example, or more personally, completely sacking Venezuela and having total control of what's going on in Venezuela, like the Russians and the Chinese do. The people that are doing this are Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping and their friends. So when you call yourself an anti-imperialist, but you refuse to call these people out, you only attack the United States, and furthermore, you actually defend people like Putin? You defend people like Xi Jinping? You're not anti-imperialist. You're a fucking asshole. You're a propaganda machine. You are not pro-democracy. You're anti-America. And that's not the same thing. Very often, it's actually quite the opposite. And again, right. this is coming from someone that has very strong feelings against the United States government, very strong feelings against America in general and American culture and American neocolonialism and, and America's pop culture imperialism but for fuck's sakes for like taking aside Edwin Snowden and all these people just talking to every normal rational person you you cannot be on the side of Putin you cannot be on the side of Xi Jinping well, we cannot deny I mean of course you know the everyday person and the everyday tank college tanky will just believe these lies and they really do think that someone like edward snowden is a hero because of, of the the things he leaked uh from the nsa which it's just incredible to me because yes what the nsa was doing is wrong but does edward snowden know what putin does uh violating do you think there is private citizen security in moscow edward but anyway um People like Edward Snowden, Jill Stein, Glenn Greenwald, there is money for this, fellas. I mean, with Edward uh, Snowden, we don't have, like, it's all, he's literally protected by the Kremlin. Yeah. Uh, but with someone like Jill Stein, she's also out there. Jill Stein, you remember Jill Stein, the presidential candidate for the Green Party? Um, another progressive hero for many. Oh. She's also out there defending Putin, even though, you know, she's been to dinners with him. She's gone to Russia several times. She's a clearly compromised figure. Um, let's talk also about one, one of these uh, propaganda machines, the Progressive International. This is crazy. They really tweeted this. I mean, it just goes to show, talk about manufacturing consent. These people are manufacturing fake history um and this is what they had the ball to tweet they lied about yugoslavia 
They lied about Afghanistan. They lied about Iraq. They lied about Libya. They are lying to you now. Imperialism on trial. Of course, speaking about what's going on in the Ukraine. Now, of course, in the Yugoslav wars, approximately 140, 100,000 people were killed and three to four million refugees were created in these wars that ended in late 2001. But of course, what they do is something we always mention in this show, you know, they put Iraq next to Yugoslavia and say it's the same thing. It's the false equivalences that they love doing. Like, like, I, I can't believe, like, Yugoslavia was a conflict that was very recent. Like, we were alive, we were kids, but we were alive when the, 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 the Civil War was happening in, in Yugoslavia. And we're talking about mass genocide going on to the point that the UN Security Council, famous for doing absolutely nothing ever, they actually got involved in Yugoslavia and, and helped put down uh, the civil war and bring democracy to the Balkans. But the fact that we're now putting this side to side with all of these different countries that are more questionable situations, it's just horrible for me. And, and the Progressive International is not even seen uh, as most people as an extremist organization. I mean... Oh, look at the DSA. Look at that. Look at the DSA. Like, people wouldn't say that the DSA is a radical organization, but fuck it. Yes, they are. They're nuts. Um, speaking of people being nuts, uh, I don't know if I sent you this tweet before, but a couple days ago, our favorite U.S. politician, Tulsi, um tweeted something hor that i couldn't believe that i was reading um i'm gonna read it to you guys we'll put it on we'll put it on screen but it's basically a video and she's saying warmongers argue that we must protect ukraine because it is a quote-unquote democracy but they are lying ukraine isn't actually a democracy to hold on to power Ukraine's president shut down three TV stations that criticized him and imprisoned the head of the opposition political party, which came in second place in the election, and arrested and jailed the leaders, exactly what Putin has been accused of doing, all with the support of the United States. Which is not only a lie, like, the things were not like that, but the fact that we're just straight up calling U.S. allies an authoritarian regime, Ukraine... Tulsi went to visit Bashar al-Assad to clean his face when we all found out he was using chemical weapons on children. And still there are people who say she Tulsi's awesome and a progressive. She sat down with the butcher Assad. I mean, it, it's time to really get serious about this I because these these people shouldn't shouldn't be in political office. I like, and I don't know how we have normalized this. I don't know how we have normalized having a person in a position of power straight up defending Putin and calling democratic allies in the world dictatorships to kind of justify whatever's going to happen or it's not going to happen now. <laughs> Exactly. To justify it, let's be clear, Ukraine, like every other country, is not perfect. It's an imperfect democracy. There's a lot of problems with corruption, as it usually happens when a country is getting a lot of foreign aid. However, things are not black and white. You know, something something is a flawed democracy, and the other is an empire ran by an oligarch who a wants collect. to take over. I mean, it's a false equivalency. It's such a false equivalence. And the only reason that you're saying it is because you want to draw support out of Ukraine because you don't want your voters or your people to actually support Ukraine. And at the same time, you're just straight up defending Putin in your tweets, which arguably Putin is the biggest threat to the United States that we currently have in the world right now. So I, it's... Like, I don't even know. I don't, ha I don't even have the words for this. It's just, it's just ridiculous. It's ridiculous that we got into this point. It seems that there were a lot of people who are leftists, but democratic leftists, who did not understand the true nature of characters such as Edward Snowden, Glenn Greenwald, Tulsi Gabbard. I think they're being so blatantly uh, 
Putin obsessed with this issue and so disregarding of Ukrainian people that a lot of people have opened their eyes to these people who have always been tankies. That's what they are. They're the typical example of tankies. And they're the kings because, you know, Edward Snowden and Glenn Greenwald, you know how we always tell tankies, well, first world well they left it but edward's not happy about it and glenn lives in a mansion in brazil like you and i have never seen so that's what's going on there and the and just to tie it up of course this is happening on the left but it's also happening on the right the the the, the ones who are it seems that the far right and the far left are not com are now competing to see who can support putin the most um it seems now that we have Edward Snowden and Tucker Carson on the same uh, kind of like spot when it comes to the Russia and Ukraine situation. And coming from the left too, uh, we've heard, we've seen some of the comments that they're doing that are very familiar to us, which is just doing generalizations and calling the people in Ukraine far right fascist, Nazis, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, ultra nationalist. Uh, you know, just because that's, of course, that's what people are when they're protest, uh, protesting a government that you actually like. They've said the same thing about us in Venezuela. They've said the same things about the protest in Cuba, which I don't know how a protest in Cuba can be encouraged by the CIA, but beats me. Those guys seem to know more about it than we do. Uh, <laughs> it's it's just it's it's ridiculous. Um, but Elu, uh, just to finish off this week's show, I did want to mention a few things um, that are happening in Central America. Yes, uh, a bit of good news that we never get from Latin America. Really, uh, the former president of Honduras, Juan Orlando Hernandez, was arrested today after uh, his country's Supreme Court decided to go by uh, a U.S. notice to arrest him because he's wanted in the U.S. for drug trafficking and uh, for weapons as well. So, you know, this Honduras has been an ally of the and I'm sorry, this is why it's a false equivalency. Yes, the U.S. does shitty things. They were an ally with this guy. Now they're putting him in jail, though. I mean, it's pretty cool. But again, nothing is black and white. And one thing doesn't mean the other. Because the new president of Honduras, everyone was talking about how great the first female president, whatever. But she's a communist dictator lover. So actually, it's not great. So even though it's good for Honduras that the former corrupt president is arrested, um, I'm not very into the first female president, sadly. Yes. But um, El, also in Nicaragua, I mean, what Ortega is doing is truly uh, a cementing of a dictatorship, how we have not seen in modern times it's, because of how quickly it's happening. It's so fast. And the, the biggest, I think this really comes back to uh, the, the, the Maduro model. I think it's what, what they, they talked about it. But it's it's the fact that Venezuela and Syria in particular and many other countries like them were an experiment for these new authoritarians that are arising. They took their time to get the country to the point where they got it. And they noticed how pretty much there was no reaction from the international community. Yes, there was a big reaction in Syria in particular, but that didn't lead, that didn't lead to like actually something changing um in syria in venezuela absolutely nothing was done other than some sanctions so now when you have a regime like ortega in nicaragua that sees these examples and he can notice that the international community is not going to do much other than sanctioning them like no one's even talking about what's going on in nicaragua uh again it just sets a terrible precedent because if maluro and chavez were able to do it over the, the span of 20 years if Assad was able to do it in the span of like also like 20 years or so. If Ortega is able to do it in the span of two years, you know, the next dictator that's going to come in Latin America is just going to do it in a week. And you can tell by what he's doing with the universities, Elu, because even in Venezuela, there are still some, I mean, they're completely run down, abandoned, terrible, but there's still some independence to some universities after 
more than 20 years of Chavismo. But Ortega just this week took over four private universities. He's doing it quickly. I mean, and this is where uh, the protests against him really are fomented because, you know, the youth movement is the one that was the biggest threat uh, to the Ortega regime a few years ago. So he's cutting them at the knees. He's just going to take over the private the, the private universities. And as this is happening, ew, the New York Times had a headline that said Nicaragua was inching towards dictatorship. Remember last year when they had the election and we had as a guest and we were like, at least finally now. The Western no will say uh, Nicaragua was a dictatorship because he blatantly stole an election. No, now it's February. He took over four private universities and the New York Times still saying he's inching towards it. I don't even know what the bar is for like those people for what the country can be considered a dictatorship. Like these are the same people that 10 years ago were calling Chavez a Democrat or, or at the, at, like at, at the most extreme scenarios, call him an authoritarian uh, leader. Uh, but it's, it's just it's just insane to me it's it's scary it's scary because it means that the 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 road from democracy to authoritarianism has just gotten shorter you know it, right. it, it now you can become a president and become a dictator in less than a year and the world's not going to do absolutely anything about it except sanctions and then we go back to russia and china because you can sanction a country but that doesn't mean that russia and china are not gonna put their feet down and start supporting and financing these regimes um, right so what are, what are we doing we're just letting them do whatever they want it's worth mentioning because the nicaragua situation is so interesting because they got rid of um ortega before and, but they didn't completely eliminate the move with uh, and anyone in dictatorship. Like, how do you deal with the authoritarian dictatorship movement once you overthrow it? Um, or not overthrow it, but maybe in the negotiation to have them leave. Look um, at Bolivia. Right, exactly. But they always come back. They always come back. They always come back because the... it. The, the the people that are Democrats, the people that are liberal, uh, they 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 really don't know how to handle the situations once they got in power, uh, and uh, it's what happened in in Nicaragua, uh, and what happened in Bolivia even like, uh, Jenny Añez was not a very democratic person herself, but to her credit, he did she did uh, respect the Bolivian institutions. She said that she was going to abandon power when she had to, and she actually did it. She recognized the results of the election, even though it was the winner was the same party that actually, you know, was trying to do a coup d'etat less than a year ago. And uh, put her in she's still in jail. She I mean. transferred the power, and then a couple weeks, a couple months later, she got imprisoned. Um, something similar happening in, happening in, in, in Nicaragua uh, right now with Ortega. So... Right, because the daughter of the the woman who took over after after Ortega's first uh, time in power, her daughter was going to be a candidate for these elections, and she is in jail. So again, you have to be very careful with how you deal with these authoritarians when you're trying to negotiate them out of power. Because was it worth it? I mean, after the civil war in Nicaragua, to once again have this horrible tyranny. Um, it's we don't we, we're losing the democratic culture of like countries like Nicaragua, countries like like Venezuela. Uh, we we have been living through this authoritarian and dictatorship regimes for decades, decades now. So there is no democratic culture. Political parties, even those that consider themselves from the opposition, don't really have any experience being in power to begin with. So if they ever get to power, it's always a disaster. Um, so it, it it's a shame. It's the reality. It's what it is. Uh, I believe and I strongly believe that. And I that's what I always say, that the world has an important role to play in helping countries gain their democracy and sustain their democracy, help them build nations. That's not a bad thing. That is a great thing. And that's what we should be doing. We should be helping other nations to build their democracy, to build their institutions. 
and let them have their own sovereignty but become a democratic liberal right. ally and we're not doing that we're isolating ourselves we don't want to take part on any conflict on any of the negotiation we want the us we want canada we want europe out of ukraine because that it's not our problem right until it is um and that's a great way to close because i did want to mention this Elu, um because maybe a lot of people think we i never personally talk bad about the us uh, or us imperialism but i had some really bad to say today and Speaking of what you just said, what our role in the world should be, um, what the way we withdrew from Afghanistan shows exactly what we're not supposed to do. We've talked about this a lot in this show. Um, I've mentioned uh, since that Afghanistan is now on the brink of famine. So we actually now have to hand money over to the Taliban to avert the crisis. We are left with no choice. Um, however, that's not the worst part. Uh, the, the Biden administration has decided that he will be splitting uh, Afghanistan funds between the Taliban and the victims of 9-11. I mean, they're stealing money. There's like, with all due respect to what, what happened right. in 9-11 and, the, the, and, right. and the horrible things that the families uh, affected by 9-11 have to go through, that is not their money. That is the Afghan people's money, the people that are going through a famine now and Believe taking it me. away from them because I don't even know what the what, what like the logic is behind it because uh, I guess Osama bin Laden was granted refuge in in in, in Afghanistan or Al Qaeda was very strong in Afghanistan but that money is not money from Al Qaeda that's not money from ISIS that's not money that's coming from a terrorist organization those are the sovereign funds of the Afghan people and taking half of it to give it to American families that's just stealing money from the afghan people that this are starving this is way worse than when we were there and you don't hear anyone talking about this grotesque situation this is way worse than when we had a few thousand troops in there you like, know what do you know what's you bad know? Hey, did you, like you know what's bad bad is that you're giving half of the funds to the taliban regime because that money it's not probably gonna go through the afghan people it's probably just gonna go to this mountain incels fundamentalist organization and they're gonna do whatever the fuck they want with that money but at least you're hoping that some of it gets to the afghan people and helps them through this famine but you're still in the other half and you're bringing 9-11 in to kind of justify it that's the most disgusting thing that i've seen the U.S. do uh, the U.S. government doing foreign policy in a while now, and that includes the Donald Trump administration. This is horrible. This there's no just there's no way to sugarcoat that what they're doing is that they're helping starve the Afghan people and they're stealing their money in their faces. So this and it shows the hypocrisy. Sorry, Elu, but like this isn't on the news as much as it was on the news when we were there. Like, you know, in the news, it was always like, so we're spending this much in Afghanistan. What are we doing in Afghanistan? 9-11 was 20 years ago. Why are we still there? Okay, is, is this better? Like, is this what the progressive crowd wanted? The non-interventionist crowd? They just want to take money? Yes, and yes, <laughs> yes. That's exactly what they want. That's exactly what I they want. They, I thought they were anti-imperialist because this smells like disgusting imperialism This to me. is imperialism. Like, if there was a time in the last 10 years that you had the opportunity to call out the United States on their right. neo-colonialism, in their imperialism, this is the one. They're stealing half of the money of the Afghan government to give it to American families that do not, do not have a claim to this money this is again not money that's coming from al-qaeda this is not money that's coming from isis this where the sovereign funds of the former afghan government you could use this funds to prevent a famine a famine people starving to death by the thousands and you decide to steal it this it's an atrocity. it's an atrocity like it boils my blood like you have no clue and you know what if before i was pissed off with the biden administration i'm triple pissed off with the biden administration i mean like let's go out to the street like i'm across the border and go to washington to protest this shit this is 
insane. This is immoral and no one's paying attention to it. Yeah, absolutely. So um, clearly we're not very happy with the Biden administration, but as we know, one thing doesn't mean the other. That doesn't mean Republicans. It means that everything has gone to shit and we will keep talking about it and keeping an eye out for on all these stories so we can discuss it with you guys here from the North. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, also, Edu, we're like the worst podcasters because you're supposed to say like subscribe, oh, like. Yeah, 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 yeah. Subscribe. Yeah. Yeah. subscribe then you know here or or here somewhere like send it on whatsapp send it to your tia send it to your auntie um and yes please support us from the north and we'll see you next week bye guys take it easy god is dead there's no redemption i love you bye